My name is Andrew Yukus. Yeah, I'm out of here. Adventurer, survivalist, and wildlife warrior. That was probably the toughest day of my entire life. I pushed myself to the limit. Whoa. That was just a love bite, as you can see. In the harshest and most dangerous environments on Earth. They are absolutely terrified. It's just me and my camera. Look at you, you're absolutely gorgeous. As I outrun and outthink some of the fastest and smartest creatures on the planet. Ah, I didn't know they did that. What you're about to see is my attempt to survive in the impenetrable Amazon, where I tackle a deadly caiman, oh, me. wrestle with a lethal bushmaster snake. Look at this, guys. They are like hypodermic needles. They are massive. And even perform surgery on myself to stop a dangerous infection. Oh, oh. Let's go, let's do it. This is South America, where I plan on spending a month traveling deep into the jungle along the Las Piedras River in the Peruvian Amazon. Here we go. It's a 12 hour bus ride and a couple of quick plane trips. I really, really, really don't like planes. And a two hour drive up a dirt road, just to get me to the starting point for my journey up the river. I'm here in Lucerna, which is a small village essentially right on the outskirts of the Les Piedras River. And this is my ride. This is going to take me into the depths of the unknown. Hola, how are we going? Good? Very good, thank you. Just testing and trying to see the engine house. Andres, nice to meet you. How are we? Very good. Nice to meet you. Andrew, <laughs> how are you? You ready to go up three? Yes. I want to test myself and my skills against the jungle. I'll need to find shelter and food each day as I try to survive in one of the harshest environments on Earth. My plan is to track down some of the unique animals of the Amazon that I've wanted to see up close since I was a kid. So I've come prepared. Uh, I've got a number of things which I'm actually going to be taking up there as gear. So I've, uh, I've really kind of stocked up on some of the main supplies which I'm actually going to need up there, including some pretty tech savvy things. So I've got some Hessian, I've got machetes, I've got game cameras. Now I'm gonna be setting up a lot of game cameras along the way. I've got fishing hooks, got brand new shoes ready to go. I've got fishing nets, I've got trace, I've got more fishing nets, I've got ropes, I've got string. I've got knives, so I'm all geared up and um, yeah, I shouldn't need anything else. I think it should be all pretty uh, pretty equipped out. I've also got a shovel as well uh, because uh, I guess I'm going to be doing a lot of digging, so a shovel's very important. So uh, I've got all the gear and let's, uh, let's see how this uh, all rolls out. Andrew, sí. please, careful. Si te pierdes en la selva, tú nunca volverás, okay? Yes, sí. Water, big trees, many birds, all good. Take care, man. All good. OK. It definitely won't be easy. The jungle is dangerous, and there are many things that can go wrong. But I'm ready. When you're trying to survive in the jungle, there's literally two things that you can't go without. The first thing is shelter, and the second thing would be fire. Without these resources, you'll soon see you will deteriorate pretty fast. What I thought I'd do today is I'd teach you how to make fire. One, two, three, quite literally. So the first thing is you need to get your material. And I'm using bamboo, and you can use different types of bamboo, but I love using this one, this nice big, big one. And today I'm gonna to be showing you how to do the bamboo fire saw. I'm gonna try and do it as fast as I can. So the process of starting fire can be done using what's called the bamboo saw method. What you're doing is you're creating a friction point to start the embers uh, into a hot coal. I've fixed it to the tree. It's not going anywhere. I've got 
some of my starter right here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it directly over the hole, as you can see, like so. And you can use a bit of bamboo just to hold it down, but normally I just do it with my fingers, like so. And let the fun begin. Normally it doesn't take that long. Okay, it broke, but it should still be fine. Tap that hot ember out. And now... There you have fire. So the game plan essentially is to see how many different species of animals I can find around my camp. So literally in a day's walk, let's see how many animals I can track down. The idea is to try and come across some of these unique animals, whether I'm seeing them right there in front of me, or alternatively, seeing some of their tracks and signs that can allude me to exactly what is hanging around. Since you're out there in the jungle, um, there's this notion to be careful of all these venomous and poisonous animals and creatures which are around you. However, it's often uh, what you don't see that can be most terrifying. Much of the Amazon is actually suited and fitted, almost like a, a gauntlet of prickly and spiky trees. This tree right here is an absolute disaster. Now, it's one of those things where you're thinking, of, oh, well, it's just, it's just on the tree. The spikes are just on the tree itself. It's all good. But what happens is this. Oh! Is... It's almost like a bark that falls down, and it always seems to land in that position like that. And if you can't see it already, they're very, very, very sharp, sharp, sharp spikes. And I've had a couple of these go into my feet and they are the worst. They're so painful and they often do get infected as well. And that there is man's worst enemy, quite literally in the jungle. And I don't know how the animals do it. I really don't. As you can see, the water here is absolutely crystal clear. As a rule of thumb, it's one of those things where you can get away without eating for up to 28 days or even 30 days at most. But three days without water, you're in a bit of trouble, I reckon. So there's a number of different species which inhabit the water. So I'm on a mission to try and find myself freshwater eels. And with the freshwater eels, generally what they're doing is they're hiding in under the embankment. And uh, I've got to be extremely careful when I'm doing this because we just never know what's lurking under there. You run, but you can't hide. But you can't hide, I'm gonna find you. The caimans, that was just a love bite, as you can see. Get a small caiman like that by the tail, they can easily come up and bite you. Got to get them behind the back of the neck, and I will. Let the water settle. Stay calm, relaxed. I'll find him. My fingers are working, it's all good. I spent the next couple of hours looking, but I never did find any eels. All the caiman. So when you're out there and you're walking through the jungle, the amount of 
fruits and nuts and the availability of food which is out there. Literally a supermarket right there on the floor. Now, this can literally be a lifesaver when you're out here in the jungle. Now, this is, you want to just make it into a dance, the Brazilian bush nut, also known locally as castanhas, I think in Spanish. Um, but you have to act fast. Reason being is there's a couple of species of animals that can get into this. Paca, aguti, and apparently the capuchin monkey, which he will actually try and crack the shell. I don't know how he does it. He must be pretty persistent. And they are quite difficult to get into. So let me give this a try. Once you get through the first one, then break the machete in half. I don't know how the animals do it. But generally when you crack open one of these larger shells, there's about 12 of these nuts and they're very high in protein, actually quite good tasting. Animals go absolutely crazy for this, particularly a capuchin monkey. Actually tastes pretty good. So you can imagine um, if you're out here in a survival situation, exactly what you're going to get into. I found something that I don't like. There's a couple of animals that I don't personally want to come across when I'm, when I'm out there uh, walking through the jungle. There's this inherent fear that I have of these animals. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you what this thing is. It's a tarantula. And I'm gonna catch it. And I'm gonna be using a technique that I used to teach myself when I was a kid uh, when trying to catch trapdoors uh, in my backyard. I'm gonna see if it works. I've got a confession to make, right? And it's this. I am petrified of spiders. I really do have a fear. I don't like them. Whoa, there it comes. Just get these sticks. Whoa, there he is, there he is, there he is, there he is. There he is. Whoa! All right, let me just, let me just try and get him up on this for a sec. Whoa. Okay, don't escape, don't escape. Let me just try and get you up on here, mate. You just see the size of him right there. Absolutely massive. And I'll be honest, these guys, they are absolutely terrifying. How can't you be terrified? of something like this out here in the jungle that can just like literally climb up on you. Now these guys will essentially eat, well they're insect consumers, but they'll also eat small frogs, lizards, and little mammals that come past their hole as well. They'll quickly grab them, boom, then they'll bring them straight back in. You can just see them there. Oh God, and they actually do get a lot bigger than this, funny enough. The tarantula. Jeez. Oh, I guess what's absolutely terrifying to me is the fact of, you know, these spiders can literally get to the size of a dinner plate. Uh, not to mention they can give you one hell of a bite as well. Uh, not the animal that you really want to mess with. Tarantulas, I hate them, I can't stand them. Now, this next guy here has got to be one of the slowest moving, if not the slowest moving creature on Earth. The fact that they're only active for four hours of the day, essentially meaning for the 20 hours that they're sleeping, they're almost impossible to find. Now, this guy here is known as the sloth, the free, the free toad sloth. Wow, look at you, you're gorgeous. You're gorgeous. Now, 
big problem with deforestation is these guys often lose a lot of habitat and a lot of the times they're killed in the process. But you can just see how beautiful he is. Now, although he's a slow moving and this does work to his disadvantage, it's also an advantage as well because just remember when you're moving so slow, not many things can see you. And this guy here, he honestly just looks like a bit of a, a moss pile up in the canopy. Wow, you are so beautiful. Look at you, hey mate. Just want to give him a hug. Ah! Until they latch on like that. Ah! 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 ah. You can see the damage. Okay, mate. I'm gonna let you go up a tree. Whenever I'm interacting with an animal for the first time, the first thing that comes into my mind is curiosity. But the second thing that comes into my mind is apprehension. Apprehension in the fact that I don't know how this animal's going to react. Look at the damage you just done, just by holding on. All wild animals are designed to protect themselves. And how they protect themselves? Well, sometimes there's a lesson to be learnt. There's things where you're out in the Pampas region and you come across a coconut. There's not much out here on the floodplain that you can use to actually crack open a coconut. Um, but there is one thing, nature's vice. You're probably thinking, what do you mean nature's vice? Well, church, there's something that lurks in this water. It's gonna help me out. Otherwise, no coconut. Now with this next guy, I have to be extremely careful. One quick snap from this guy and I could seriously lose a hand. So this guy here is known as the Black Cayman. Right yeah. Before I do, I'm just gonna go here. This down. You're all right, mate. Settle down. Now I've already had dealings with one of these guys before. Oh, oh, me. But obviously he was a lot smaller. Being bitten by this guy here, he's obviously going to inflict a lot more damage. You'd actually be surprised at how quick these guys can move. Now this is only a small one. Uh, ah, 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 ah. Oh, got you. Oh. you see how well calculated even this little guy can be. We just want to get a bite on me. Come on, <laughs> you want it? You want to bite me, don't you? Hey, settle, settle, settle. If he really wants to come on, go. Hey, ya! Uh, settle, 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 settle. First thing you need to do is get them out of the water, because in the water you're dealing with quite a dangerous animal. Uh, essentially, the water is his element. Having dealt with many dangerous animals over the years, one thing I've had to learn is their behavioural cues. How they're going to react when I approach them. When this guy's going to attack and when I need to jump out of the way. Okay, come on. Out you come, mama. Out you come. Jump, Now he's under no real stress here. These guys here are literally as tough as nails. We're talking about an ancient dinosaur. And I'm leading him out of the water to see if this guy can help me with a bit of a project. So caimans have an amazing bite force. And believe it or not, they can actually close that jaw with 2,900 pounds per square inch of pressure quite literally feels like a road train going over your hand if he gets you. Let's see if you can crack a coconut for me. Come on, ready, mate? Ready? All right. Ready? Three, two, one. Oh, 
Leute. Now you can quite literally hear that coconut cracking as soon as he gets it in his grip. You gotta crack my coconut. Come on. Coconut time. Let go of my coconut. It's not even funny. George, my coconut. Thank you. All right, you go your way. I'm gonna get my coconut. Now, you can see he's actually gave that a good crack. And I reckon all I need to do is one last thing, caveman style. One, two, and guys, there you have it. That was the starting point, or essentially the catalyst in cracking the coconut. So, yeah, you do your thing. I'm gonna do mine. When I'm out here on these endeavours, one of the core purposes of my survival is being able to sustain myself out there in the environment. The jungle offers quite a diversity of food. You just gotta know where to look for it. All right, so essentially what I'm doing is I'm just trying to find myself a nice sturdy tree like this. Now the river I'm living next to is home to some pretty dangerous and deadly animals like caimans, piranhas and snakes. And of course, I've already learnt that they'd love to get a piece of me. But the river is also a great place to pick up some dinner, if you know where to look. Now start looking into the water's edge and you'll soon find food. I'm just going to move real slowly because there's one here and then there's a big one, which is right there. And you ever find yourself in a survival situation and you need to get food, eating stingray, it's a very easy food. And simply, all you want to do is just stun them. And that's how you get a stingray, like so. And what I've come to learn is a couple of different things. A, keep moving, because the sand flies are absolutely unbearable. Sand flies drive you absolutely crazy. Um, so essentially, these guys here are a really good source of food, really high in protein. This will keep you alive out here, but please be warned, be very careful. So I've been very careful whilst walking through the shallows here, because yes, these guys do have a very Sharp spike, you can just see right there, and that comes right over the back. If it gets you, mate, you're gonna be in all sorts of pain. What I like to do is just use some green bamboo because that's gonna have some difficulty in starting off. And try and get it around about yay. Essentially, I lay my stingray on top like so. And there you go, it's actually not too bad. Simply, you just peel this back and you can just see how nice that white meat is inside right here. That's the meat that you're eating off the stingray. It's a very nice white meat. Very soft, very tender. I'll tell you what, Definitely goes a long way. I wanted to gauge a bit of an understanding of what animals were actually surviving outside my tent door. So having set up a number of game cameras around my base camp, it was unbelievable to see the diversity of animals that were just lingering around. Most of the animals in the jungle are nocturnal, so the place comes alive at night. Turns out, it's like a freeway out there. Over the course of one night, the game camera captured a margay, capybaras, a bush rat, 
D. A raccoon. A bush dog. A packer. And a beautiful ocelot. Part of the pledge and purpose of what I'm doing has a main focus on education. And part of that education is conservation. And if I can borrow an animal's time and bring it to the camera and talk about it, not only am I promoting this species, but I'm also promoting the habitat in which this species thrives in. All right, we're recording. Okay, so this morning, we came down to the river. A bit of a wash, and essentially, I spook something in here. There's quite a bit of activity that's been happening all up along here. Looks like this has been chewed out as well. So essentially we're gonna find out exactly what is hiding inside this hollow. Hopefully it's something exciting. Some of these animals. Okay, so. Okay, okay. All right, this guy here's a little mouse possum. I think I'm gonna try and pick him up. Ha, oh. oh, I gotcha. I oh, gotcha. There he goes. <laughs> now look at you. Now you can just see him right there. Now this guy here, he's known. Let me just get a better. Ah, don't bite, don't bite, don't bite. Let me just get a proper. Hold on you. There we go. Like so. Now these guys here. I'll tell you a funny story because ah, ah, bit me. <laughs> now they got razor sharp teeth. But these guys here, they're called the mouse opossum, and they're actually part of the Didelphidae family. Particularly, they are an insectivore, meaning that they consume insects. Having said that. They are quite an opportunist, meaning that they will feed on other varieties of foods, whether it be nuts, fruits, berries, anything that falls on the ground, you can be sure these guys will eat it. But they are quite home in the trees as well. And they often get preyed upon by things like ocelots, margays, jaggerundis, and many of the other cats. But you can just see the sharp teeth that he's got is absolutely adorable. Okay, mate, I'm gonna give you a bit of a release. Back in the hole. There we go. All right. Hey, you wanna go that way? Just keep getting bitten by little creatures out here. Ever since I was a child, I've always had this amazing fascination for snakes. And having caught some of the most venomous snakes on Earth, there was one snake I had to catch over there in the Amazon, and that was the Bushmaster. The Bushmaster was a snake that the locals call the landmine. Look at this, look at this, can you see it? That's him there. <laughs> wow! Look at you, you are amazing! This guy here, is known as the Bushmaster. He is the largest species of venomous snake in South America. It's important not to forget one thing, that the strike of a snake like this can be absolutely lightning fast, not to mention that this species of snake he is highly, highly, highly venomous. And the locals, absolutely fear him. Gotta be very careful now. Okay, he's only on the back of the neck. Well, he's trying to pull, he's trying to pull. Oh, this is dangerous, this is so dangerous. With my stick, I can't see. Oh, now. 
try and show you those things. Oh, shit. oh, shit. oh, whoa. Look at this, guys. Look at them. They are like hypodermic needles. They are massive. They are absolutely massive. They are absolutely massive. This is one snake you just don't want to get bit by. Can you get my hand out of there? Oh. So there's an animal which is on the bucket list, and that is the armadillo. And it's funny because, like, looking at these game cameras, you can see him moving through the bush, but I haven't seen one in person. But I know they're out there, and they're definitely out there in number. I thought this to be, oh, I didn't know they did that. Originally, I thought this to be <laughs> the nine banded armadillo, but it's not. And essentially now I'm confused because I don't know what species of armadillo he actually is, but me and my amigo, <laughs> we found this guy. And I tell you what, look, he does get into defense, he pushed out, he bites. Look at him. Yeah. You can see that these guys obviously have a lot of power to them. A lot of power. And essentially, they are a digger. <laughs> but they're such a beautiful animal. Whoa! And I don't know, I don't know if they bite or not, so I'm not gonna test them. But wow, look at you. Aren't you amazing? Aren't you amazing? Now, essentially, I've dealt I've dealt with the nine banded armadillos, but I haven't dealt with this species yet. It's absolutely amazing. And I'll tell you what, trying to get these guys out of a hole is quite difficult because once they bury down, that shell which protects them is absolutely amazing. Obviously, they're not an arboreal species, they're a terrestrial species, and you can just see those claws, they're absolutely designed for digging. It's such a beautiful animal, well armored. But if I'm struggling, Whoa. If I'm struggling with this little species here, I can't imagine what's gonna happen when I actually come across a giant armadillo because they are literally 10 times as big and 10 times as powerful. They don't call it the rainforest for no reason. It's the rainforest because it's always raining. And when it is raining, well, you might as well get wet. I just hope the deadly caimans, piranhas and snakes that live in this river Stay now the rain. You know that saying that goes, ants in your pants? Literally, ants in your pants. That is actually from, look at that, look at the devastation. Look at my pants. Look at how many holes. They actually just get into it and they eat and eat and eat and eat these little fibers. They take them back to their little nest. That's great, you build a little nest out of it. Now I've got no pants, quite literally. Look, my ass is gonna fall out. It's actually unbelievable. The insects here, they just don't stop. They're just relentless. They actually just don't stop. They don't give you a break. They don't give you one second. You know, it's funny. 
the longer that you spend in the Amazon, the more you start to realise that you become a part of the Amazon. You know, there's no sense in trying to conquer the place because, well, you're not going to. One of the first things you realise is the mental strain of it and the fact that anything that you want to work doesn't, doesn't work. You know, you've got to try things over and over and over and over again. And what may seem like a very simple task or a 10 minute task, or you might place an hour of the day, generally, whatever it is in the jungle, times it by four. So what takes you one hour, will take you four. As soon as I'd entered into the Amazon, it's like entering into the green room, quite literally. One big green wall, such a monotone environment. And as free and as wild as you are out there, you're encapsulated completely by this environment. And when I was out there for a couple of weeks, I could start to feel the immense pressure of the environment around me. Slowly, it was starting to break at every single aspect of my body, not just physical, but mental as well. Oh. When you're in the Amazon, you, you lose all sense of control. The jungle is unforgiving. It's always trying to take something from you. It's almost like one big parasite, slowly eating and decaying away at your physical ability, your mental stability. As part of their training, the army sends the elite guys into the jungle to see if it will break them. It's a final test physically and mentally. This is a very unnerving environment to go into. It's nature's testing ground, and that's why many people have lost their lives going into it. Regardless of how you're feeling, whether it be physical or mental, at the end of the day, you still have to survive. You need to keep proactive. You need to have set objectives throughout the day, whether it's starting fire, starting shelter, or hunting for food. <laughs> and I bet this is the same scenario as yesterday. Yes, it is. All right, George. Catfish. Now, that seems to be all I'm catching. And it's funny because every single time I bring them out of the water, they're stunted like this. And just gotta be careful of a catfish because they've got a spike on the back of their tail, which you don't wanna get done because you'd be in a world of pain. So that's a catfish there. And you can just see the bite marks, which are based on the back of the tail. You're thinking, well, what's that? Church, that's a piranha. When you're catching things out here, sometimes it's not just for you, sometimes you're catching it for other things as well. So the key is, as soon as you catch something, you've got to get it out of the water, because otherwise, church, you're just feeding the river, quite literally. Cayman, turtles, piranha. Mate, these guys are on the menu. I've got a stick. I've got a stick. I know you can't see what's going on. It's all right. Oh, all right, so this guy here, he's known as the Tamanjua. And you can just see the display that he's putting on. Essentially, that's a warning display, because if I get my hands in here, he can cut me open something severe. Now, what's interesting about these guys is they don't have sharp teeth, but they don't need teeth to inflict pain. These guys here have the longest set of nails and the most strongest arms that you've ever came across. Predominantly, this guy is an ant eater. Ant eater and termites. But the thing is, you don't want to get too comfortable with one of these guys because they can literally cut you open like a knife through butter, quite literally. Now, the funny thing about this species is predominantly they are boreal, but they often do come down to the ground and it's obviously not as big and menacing as the giant anteater, his relative. But this guy still can put up quite a display. And you can just see that he's very calculated animal. 
as you can see. You're okay, mate. You're beautiful, aren't you? Look at you. Hey, get out of here, bloody Whenever I catch something, they take. Going into this endeavor, there was obviously a number of animals that I had on the catch list. And it wasn't just mammals and reptiles. It was also birds as well, particularly birds of prey. Now, the vulture is a scavenger. He's an absolute opportunist out there in nature. Any kind of dead food laying around, well, chooch, he's going to be on top of it. It's one of those animals that I had to get close and personal with. So I've set up a trap. <laughs> All right, so you can just see him. They're taking off. OK, I better, I better get this guy under control. OK, OK, OK. OK, you're OK. The bird has not been harmed in any way whatsoever, and I'll actually show you that right now. And that is the magic of being able to set the snare in such a way that the animal is not going to get hurt. Now, let me just set the camera up in such a way that I can just see what's going on. And that there is one beautiful bird, the vulture. Now, I'm not sure what species, he's in a bit of a pant mode, but uh, at the end of the day, when catching birds, um, birds which are opportunistic and love to come to bait, the best way in order to catch these birds is to understand flight plans, understand the way that these animals move, understand their behaviour, understand their footsteps and any other things which may help in trying to capture such a beautiful species like this. Absolutely amazing. You just see him, I'm just going to bring him out real nice and close. Right there. Oh, wow. Unbelievable. The vulture. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm gonna give you a release. A bit of release back into nature. And oh, I wonder which way you're gonna fly, mate. But here we go. Ready? Three, two, one. Thank you. Go live life, mate. Go live life. So it's only been three weeks, and already things are starting to pop up, including this little guy. Right, so I just came down for a wash at the river. And that saw that's been on the side of me, I've had it there for two or three days, and longer, about a week now, over a week. It started getting really sore and sore, a bit of an infection. But I think I know what it is. And um, I think something's inside there, funny enough. Well, not funny enough, but you know what I mean. So I've actually got some duct tape, a little bit of a trick, just a little bit of soap and some duct tape. I'm just going to um, place that over the wound and just keep it there overnight. And then tomorrow I'm going to try and extract what I think may be a bot fly. And it's really annoying. Really annoying. It's very painful. Now, it's very difficult for me to explain what it feels like for something to be living inside of you. And to be honest, it's actually quite unnerving. But knowing that something is living and breeding inside of you and you're the host, well, that was an experience that I never wanted to have. One of the first things that you realise when you come to the Amazon is what may seem to be um, something which may occur which seems less problematic, such as uh, insect bites, can soon turn to infection. And uh, as soon as you have a little bit of an infection start out here in the Amazon, you know, with the moisture, the humidity, 
and all the other bacteria that may be around. Um, essentially, it's just going to bloom from there. Like a subcutaneous cyst that has kind of formed after an insect bite. It can be extremely, extremely, extremely painful. Still smiling, still sane, just the jungle is probably the most difficult environment to survive on earth. It is, and it does take everything out of you. The jungle was once called a wasteland back in the day. But when I think of jungle now, I think of a mysterious landscape which harbours not just the greatest diversity of wildlife and plants, but what sets as the background to our existence. I will say this, anyone that comes to the jungle wanting to conquer this landscape, you will be turned around very fast. And I have been turned around. I feel like it's broken me many ways, but it's always been a learning experience every single step of the way. But if I'm going to leave this place, I will have you know that I'm going to leave it in style. This is what's going to be taking me home. I want to go home. Had enough. So this bathroom is actually made from balsa wood. Now balsa wood is very, 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 very light wood. Oh. But literally, uh, uh. It makes a great, great raft. And not just that, is the bar of the balsa wood is just as good in making the cordage that you need to tie the entire thing together. Right. My 30 days is up. And it's unbelievable going into an environment like this. The experience was absolutely breathtaking something that I'll hold with me forever. I think what was interesting was the mind frame and the lens that I went into this experience with was completely changed at the end of it. I never thought that this experience was going to move me as much as it did. My name is Andrew Yukus. Yeah, I'm out of here. Adventurer, survivalist, and wildlife warrior. That was probably the toughest day of my entire life. I pushed myself to the limit. Whoa. That was just a love bite, as you can see. In the harshest and most dangerous environments on Earth. They are absolutely terrifying. It's just me and my camera. Look at you, you're absolutely gorgeous. As I outrun and outthink some of the fastest and smartest creatures on the planet. Ah, I didn't know they did that. I've just got a mouthful of his venom. For this adventure, I travelled to Zambia in southern Africa with a shopping list of amazing African animals that I'm dying to see. My plan is to get up close and personal to at least 12 animals in just seven days. Now I'm out of here. That's the Africa Big Five, plus some bonus extras. Uh, uh, uh. Settle. So he just tried to bite himself. Thought it was me, huh? I'll capture it all on camera, showing you unique behaviours by getting face to face, even with the killers. Okay, mate, I'm gonna leave these guys alone. Woo! Welcome to Africa.
Look at this. I'm barely off the plane on day one. There's a young female lion tucking into a giraffe already. And I reckon if she didn't have such a good feed, she'd be eyeing me off for lunch. Oh, Africa, how good is this going to be? It's been a lifelong dream of mine to come to Africa, and now I'm finally here. People are always amazed I go into the wild alone but I just love it. More importantly, I have the skills to look after myself, no matter if it's Australia, Asia, or South America, or here in Africa, you follow the rules. And you always gotta keep just a sharp eye out. You know, I'm always looking over the other side of the bank, always looking on this side of the bank as well, upstream 100 metres, but it's always a, a nerving feeling. When you get to an area like this, and then you see, prints like these, or these lines. You can just see their paw prints moving all the way up. It's a dung of elephants. You can tell just by coming down to the water's edge. You can see the foot marks made by the elephants. You can see the marks made by hippos. I'm keen to get started on my list, and I'm hoping to find one of my favourite animals right here in this river. So I'm making my way up to this waterfall, as you can see, just up ahead. I'll tell you what, the current pushing a little bit makes it a bit tricky, particularly when these rocks are so slippery. But the particular animal which I'm after out here is a Nile monitor. And I've already seen a couple of them. Now, modern lizards, they're very fast, but they can be very tricky to handle as well. Well, that's just it. They're a specialist of the water. And me, well, I'm a fish out of water. So this animal has every advantage over me. Coming into an experience like this, it's quite literally a life and death situation. So whenever I hear like a bit of a splash, the first thing that comes to my mind is crocodile. He's my only worry when I'm in the water. When I'm out of the water, it's fine. But when I'm in the water, it's a bit of a problem. It's always concerning getting myself into murky water like this because at the end of the day, I don't know what's in there. I don't know what's lurking beneath that surface. From crocodiles to venomous snakes, anything could be lying wait. But to be honest, this is the best way at trying to catch one of these little guys. I'll put him safely back, but this river has plenty more animals to admire. So believe it or not, the hippo is actually regarded as the most dangerous animal in Africa, and I can tell you why. When you're first looking at an animal like this and you see the size of this animal and how large he is, you wouldn't fathom that this animal is fast. But guess what, Church? They're incredibly fast. And not just that, they can be quite aggressive as well. The 
hippopotamus. He's actually the most feared animal in all of Africa because he takes the most lives. But he's right at home, right here in the water. Now this is all just a big bluff display, a lot of splash, a lot of showing teeth. But you've always got to keep a close distance from the bank because these guys here, they're jet quick. As soon as they get up into the bank, mate, they'll go 20, 30 metres. They'll do it like that. No time whatsoever. One of these guys gets a bite on you, mate, it's all over. You're finished. Hey, what? I'll be sweating out here, but lucky it's a bit cool. Okay, mate, I'm gonna leave these guys alone. You can see that they're just extremely territorial. We've got a big male here, he's the dominant one. He's just putting up this big display. But I'm just going to leave these guys be. And I'm gonna keep making my way down the riverbank. But you just gotta be so careful out here you know, coming for a bit of a swim. You've seen a lot of these villagers swimming in the water. You come in down here, you can easily get caught out and he'll give you one big chomp you'll never forget. In going to a continent like Africa, there's many animals which spark my curiosity. Not just the dangerous ones, not just the venomous ones. Also the ones which are quite rare. Also the ones which are quite hard to find. Well, this little guy here, he's known as the side-striped chameleon. And look at him, he's absolutely just keeping a real close eye on me. Now these guys head right at home in amongst the trees. And you just see his coloration perfectly camouflage in amongst the leaves, right here on the stem, away from the predators. Because he's not a fast moving lizard, one of his adaptations that he uses is his really keen eyesight. He's got a 360 degree angle. He can just search. So if there's something coming up behind him, something trying to stalk him, he can just stand still, mimic him with the branches. And what he'll do is he'll actually start to sway. He'll start to move really, really, really slowly. There you go, mate. You can see the way he moves, he's absolutely gorgeous. Hey, come on, mate. He's absolutely gorgeous. Look at him go. Hey, yeah, you just want to climb up into the trees. They've got this big, long, sticky tongue, just as long as their body, and they'll just flick it out. And they'll just swallow. Moths, butterflies, crickets, grasshoppers, you name it, it all comes into this guy's diet. All right, mate, there you go. I'll let you back onto the brink. Gorgeous. Having caught many venomous species of snake throughout my life, I've unfortunately been bitten in the past. So knowing this, I know that every kind of bit of attention to detail is very important. However, going there to Africa was going to be a completely new ball game. I'd never dealt with a snake that could spit its venom before. Out here searching for a species of snake, which has got one hell of a reputation. This guy is known as the spitting cobra. That's right, and before you even touch a snake, he's already spraying venom up into your face, gets into your eyes, and it can make you blind. So what, wouldn't be good. And that's exactly why I'm wearing these sunglasses. Yeah. Okay, spit up, spit up, spit up. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Spit up, spit up, spit up, spit up. Woo! Okay, I just gotta keep my mouth closed because he's about to spit. I've just got a mouthful of his venom. It's not gonna cause any damage. The damage comes from when he hits you in the eyes. And I'll tell you what, when that stuff goes in your eyes, it's like boiling water in your eyes. Absolutely kills, it's like acid. I'll tell you what, these spitting cobras, they have one hell of a head on them. They're all venom glands. Look at you. You're absolutely amazing. Just trying to get a good hold on this snake. Oh, look at the size of him. Mate, 
Look at the head on you. You're just absolutely deadly. And I'll tell you what, those eyes, absolute precision with those eyes, absolute precision. Okay, mate, I better get you out of here. Having lived with animals my entire life, it's gave me an extraordinary ability to be able to understand their behaviour. This is absolutely vital in trying to survive out there with them. Not only do you have to be aware of their behaviour and how they're going to respond to you, you also need to become completely aware of when to back off. Okay. See? They're right there. That's a warning. That's saying, go away. Okay. Okay. He wins. Being on the same playing field as an African bull elephant can be quite intimidating. And having an understanding of his signals is going to be the difference between you getting out of there alive or being trampled. One good thing elephants can do, apart from trumpeting, it's letting you know when you're not welcome. And getting close to this guy, I really wanted to see how far I could push it before he turned and stopped me out of his territory. You can see whenever they come into like a bit of a fret mode, they always have their tail, bang, straight up in the air. Just give us the go. How protective some of these elephants can be. As soon as you come close, they're just chasing you. Absolutely amazing. So getting close and personal to these elephants is such an amazing experience and one that I'll hold with me for a lifetime. But there's another side to this, a side that I never saw before. And talking to a ranger, there was a whole new reality about what these animals were facing out there in the wild. Well, I'm actually just being taken now uh, by the ranger to a, a holding facility. And um, this area is uh, you know, quite controlled. But um, you know, the, the products which come into this room, this holding facility is all uh, material which has been confiscated from the poachers. You know, everything from lions to, to, to hippo skulls, and you know, it all ends up here. So it would just be a good idea just to show you the extent of how much does get poached. And this is, um, this is very little compared to you know, the overall picture, but um, this should be very interesting. So these are all the guns which have been confiscated. Oh, this is just from poachers. This is just one of the few. Just one of the few. Here. One of the few containers. Yes. All these have been confiscated. All, all by us. By us. These are on, on, on a smaller scale because most of these are just go to shoot um, small animals like impala, lechwe, zebra. So every single gun here tells a story. Every single of a gun. Every single gun here has fired and killed. An animal. So Andrew, come and show you something. Yes, yes. You yes. know what this is? You know what this is? Yeah, I think you know it. I do. I do know what this is. This is a, uh, a foot trap. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, the foot traps which I've seen uh, are a lot uh, smaller in size than this. So this here, this is confiscated from a poacher. From a poacher. As you can see, all this is black smith stuff. Yes, all black. They made this by themselves. So this will hold. An elephant. It will definitely hold it once it catches like this with this. The jaws. The elephant will not go anywhere. You've seen one of these capture an animal before? Yeah. yeah I've actually witnessed seeing it. This is what man can do. This is what man mankind can do. can do to you know to wildlife. To wildlife. If you let it if you let this continue, it will lead to an extinction.
Spending time in Africa was also about meeting up with the locals and finding how they existed out there on the landscape, learning their skills, their techniques, and a little bit about their lifestyle as well. You know, trying to navigate through this sort of bushland, the only way to do it is with professional trackers from out this way, because otherwise, so it would be impossible. You get lost very easy, very, very easy. And um, we're going pretty well prepared today. Apparently, we're going to be walking two hours into this bush. There's a, <laughs> there's a bit of a local legend out here that says that there's a, a very large snake. And I've put it to some of the local villagers that um, this snake, it shouldn't be a problem to catch. And um, they don't believe me. So we're going to go for a bit of a wonder. You're going to take me to where this snake is and um, you're going to see if I can capture this oh, large wonder. python. We'll see how we go. <laughs> the locals were only going to take me so far. Then it's up to me to find the python. Is the African, is the African rock python out here in central eastern Africa? Oh, he's absolutely beautiful, absolutely gorgeous, aren't you, mate? Now this guy here, he's predominantly a nocturnal species, and pretty much what he'll do is he'll just make his way up, climb in these trees, and he's a bird specialist. He'll eat the birds. He'll also eat things like monkeys, ratels, mongooses. He's absolutely beautiful. Unlike your members and your vipers, this guy here. He's a constrictor. And what I mean by that is, you're okay, mate. I just don't want him to turn around and take a snap at me. You're okay, he's okay. You just gotta act really calm with these snakes, really calm and complacent. At the end of the day, if he does bite you, it's only gonna be a laceration. It's only muscular tissue damage, that's all. You don't have to worry about going to hospital. What these guys will do is I'll go along the forest floor and they've got these heat sensors just up along the top of their lip. They've got these beautiful heat sensors. And what they'll do is they can actually sense any little mammal which is going along the floor. So what he'll do is as that animal's moving very, very slowly, very, very slowly, he'll sit and wait. He'll sit and wait. When the time's right, he'll just come out like that. Bang! One big whack. Grab. He's got these recurved teeth so the animal can't get away. And he'll just turn, turn his body around it, around it and around it and around it, constricting it very, very slowly. Absolutely gorgeous, aren't you, mate? And you can just see the, the size of him and just the strength of this snake. It's absolutely amazing. I can just feel the muscles just getting so, so tight. You're absolutely gorgeous, aren't you? Now, within this guy's mouth, is he'll have up to 100 or more so teeth, just recurved, so sharp teeth going backwards. So let me just go like this, around. Okay. Wow. Absolutely beautiful. Some of the native villagers believe, whoa, settle. So he just tried to bite himself. Thought it was me, ha, huh? miss me. So some of the native villagers believe that these snakes can get so big that they can even, sometimes even swallow small children when they get big enough. Very, very dangerous. You're okay, mate. You're okay. All right. Well, what we're doing here today is we're after a particular species of animal which is quite reclusive. And um, we've got a couple of professional trackers here that, well, they know what they're doing. If there's any animal that I want to catch more in this world, uh, it's a honey badger, or they often call it the ratel. Now, not only are they the most fearless of animals, I think because of their home range, it makes them quite hard to track down. <laughs> so generally, when you're looking for honey badgers, we're well, going to find a location where there's honey. And now uh, we've just been trekking in through the bush for some pretty thick scrub. We've seen a tree here, and uh, we're gonna have a bit of a feed, just replenish ourselves, get a bit of energy so we can keep moving through the scrub. It's so thick out here. Yeah. So I can eat. You can eat, yes. I'll, I'll try, I'll try a bit. Oh, I can see, look at that. <laughs> That's beautiful. How did you know this tree had honey? <laughs> yeah. We just saw 
because uh, the moment it, when it was just okay here, there was a sign of them going in, so we discovered that they are making honey. Oh, you saw the bees going in? The bees going in, Okay, yes. so the only way to tell if a tree has honey in it is to physically see the bees flying. Yeah. So you can just see that honey, and it's absolutely... <laughs> that's the best honey in the world. Best Look honey. at that, oh. Mm. Now, the honey badger is probably one of the most elusive animals. So if there was any animal that was going to outsmart me, it was obviously going to be the honey badger. So we've came across what looks like fresh tracks. Very much. This, this is honey badger? Yeah, it is. With a honey badger, generally, uh, I understand sometimes it's got a couple of holes, but he should be retreating inside. Very much. Well, what's he been digging for? Roots? It was scouting for roots and food. So he's like insects, larvae. Yeah, it looks, it looks pretty decent, yeah? When I say these guys are hard to catch, I'm yeah, not kidding. Pretty deep. We're going to be digging here for a while. Very much. <laughs> Didn't seem to matter what I did when I was out there. Who I linked up with, the greatest professional, the guy that had seen one last. This animal was always one step ahead of me. We'll be able to dig a pool. Or In the I end, I just had to call it a day. Okay, we'll start digging. Even with local help, my quest to track down a honey badger unraveled into a massive failure. So although I was outsmarted by the honey badger, there was an animal that was on the bucket list. And this guy here had been a little bit of a prickly character to the local farmer. One, he's one. Where, where? Oh, he's in here. Got him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I got him. I got him. Woo! Got those front legs. Got those front legs. Woo! OK, settle there. Settle there. Okay, so this is a walking pot, okay? Grab the leg, grab the leg, grab the other leg. Okay, bring him back, bring him back. Okay, have you got a good grip? The southern crested porcupine uh, essentially would have to be the hardest animal to catch on earth. Now I'm gonna hold the legs, and if I struggle, then you've got to grab the front legs again. So let go, let go. I would much rather go up against a lion than a porcupine. They are quite literally um, the most unforgiving animal to come across, that's for sure. Woo! This guy here is known. It's the porcupine. And I'll tell you what, this animal, uh, 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 settle down. He's probably one of the hardest animals to handle. And this guy's been giving the farmers a lot of problems. He's the consumer of potatoes. He's the consumer of pumpkins, pineapples. Now it's a myth with these animals that they actually shoot these spears. But I'll tell you what, they're one of the hardest animals to handle, one of the hardest animals to capture. And I was lucky enough to get my hand in under to grab his back leg. And that's the only way you can handle these animals. Any other way, it is impossible, absolutely impossible. But these guys here, they'll put on one hell of a warning display. And right now, he's in fret. He's in fret mode. You can see, you can see. Right, settle down, mate, settle down. One of these spikes can go right through you like a knife through butter. So quick, it's not funny. And I'll tell you what, he's making me sweat. But I've got a hold of you, mate. You're not going nowhere. Now, the funny thing is, where there's one porcupine, there's generally many porcupines. He's not the only one that's out here. There's probably many, many more. You're absolutely gorgeous, aren't you, mate? Yeah. Woo! So, oh, oh. 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 <laughs> well done. <laughs> so you yeah. still got me one. Yeah, hey, got you one, mate. <laughs> right. Look at the size of that thing. I'll tell you what, mate. Oh. So after trying to catch honey badgers and tracking down porcupines, you got to remember, Chuch, that it's like 45 degrees out there. So the best idea is to cool down the river with the kids. Are we going to have a race? <laughs> okay, ready? Oh, boy. He's all too quick. He's used to the water. <laughs>
Doesn't matter what's going on here, there's always an audience. Maybe these monkey kids are waiting to have a turn at the river too. This guy here's got two names, the blue monkey, which is the common name, or the psych monkey. He's just taking a little bit of a nap under this big tree. Now, it's always important with monkeys that just um, don't look him in the eyes, because as soon as you look him in the eyes, you look like a bit of a threat. Now, this guy here, obviously, he wouldn't attack me. He's too small. But what he would do is probably throw something at me, <laughs> just for a bit of fun, like a stick. What they'll do is I'll hang around all these little groups and clangs, and you just see them jumping in amongst the trees, and they're very vocal, making this booming noise. Boop, 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 boop. And they're actually communicating between each other. Generally, their little clangs will consist of about 20 individuals. He's not sure, is he? What he'll do is he'll eat everything from little berries, insects, mammals. Checking himself for fleas, he's eating fleas. Very curious animals. So he's consistently looking around, looking around for predators as well. Other monkeys, big predatory birds, and even snakes. Always scaring, always looking, 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 looking. That big tail. It's absolutely gorgeous. guys here, they're known as the Cape Buffalo. You can just see them, they've all got these really cute, cute eyesight. They're not taking their eyes off me. They're absolutely amazing. So we'll see how close we can get to them. Coming into an experience like this, it's quite literally a life and death situation. You need to be able to identify a flight plan to get yourself out. So whether it's identifying a tree, a natural barrier like a bush or a bit of vegetation that you can hide behind, it's going to be absolutely critical because at the end of the day, if that animal decides that he wants you, the only difference between life and death in that situation is going to be your flight plan. Because these animals, they will attack you, they will come at you. So if one comes running from this way, bang, I go up into this tree. If one comes running from another way, Bang, I go up into the other tree. They're absolutely amazing animals, aren't they? So the local people here cultivate a number of food plants that they survive off, but they also hunt and gather a lot of food around them as well, including fish, insects, and even caterpillars. And this was something I was really intrigued to go and learn. So we've with um, Karos, one of the villagers here that knows how to live off the land. And it's absolutely scorching heat out here, but we're gonna go out and get some bush tucker today. So yeah, let's see. Let's see how much food we can actually gather. I see, up here. So, what, what's this one called? This is Mupundu. We found a Mupundu. Uh, Mapundu is like a small yellow fruit, and um, do you have to boil it or you can eat it? Just like that. You can uh, eat it like that. Like that, they are ready. Oh, they're ready. Well, what are we, what are we waiting for? Let's get this tree down. <laughs> so this is Mapundu, the Mapundu fruit, and I'll tell you exactly how it tastes. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> you thought it was poisonous, eh? <laughs> no, it's not, it's not <laughs> no. poisonous. It tastes very nice, very, very nice. But the real bush tree, believe it or not, these guys. There's plenty of them, isn't there? Yeah. Wow. And these ones here, they're decent size, aren't they? 
this is the nice, the, the good size of them to be eaten now. So this is a good yeah, size. Yeah, it's a good size. Okay, and so how do we do it? So we just we just squeeze it out. You just squeeze it, yes. Okay, just so. squeeze it like that. It's so uh, all you're really eating is just the thick inside. So yes, that there, that's all the like the plant material. Okay, you can see. Like that. Is that right? Yeah. All out. And then so this, my friends, is going to be dinner. But wait, there's also dessert. Coffee, coffee fruit, yeah? yeah coffee fruit. These are ready. Yeah, they are very much ready. Okay. Yes, oh yeah, very soft, very soft. And we, you don't have to boil, you can just, you can just, just eat, you can relish. Just eat like this, just eat like this. And it's very nice, very sweet. And inside there, there's something which is very hard, and when you break it, yeah. there's a groundnut inside. A groundnut? Yeah. Uh, and can you eat that as well? Yeah, you can eat it as well. Oh, there you go. Yes. Hmm. That's toffee for it. Beautiful. This is where it stays. So this is uh, cassava leaves. Yeah. Okay, and the way that you do this is just... And then what, what, what do you do with these leaves? Hold them. Put them in the pot. Yeah, and some water. Put them in the fire. Oh, very good, very good. Smells all right, smells nice. <laughs> smells good. <laughs> So the local kids this morning have spotted a black mamba. Now this is one of the most venomous snake species which is found in the African continent. And this is going to be my first face to face with one of these deadly snakes. I guess the benefit that I have is that it's very, very cold in the morning still. The sun's just coming up. So if I do find one, it's still gonna be a little bit sluggish, which is good, particularly when dealing with something like a black mamba. There's such a fast moving snake. You know, you've always just gotta make sure that the temperature around you is adequate enough for you to be able to catch the snake. Well then tailing the snake could be extremely dangerous. Very, very dangerous. So this guy here, He's the most dangerous snake in Africa, the black mamba. He's also the most feared snake. He's absolutely making me sweat. A bite from a snake like this out here is certain death. Settle, settle down. You're okay, mate. You're okay. You can see he's just flicking his tongue out. He's just trying to get as much information as he can from the air around him about what I am. He's absolutely beautiful. He's gonna wanna take a strike very soon. The only reason why I can do this right now is because he's at a very cold temperature. It's really early in the morning. I've got him out here on top open ground and now I've been able to handle him. And you can just see how cool, calm, ah, 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 how cool, calm and collected this snake is. He has perfect vision and he's just trying to wrap himself around me like a tree so that way he can turn around and get a good bite. But you can just see the size of him. He's about eight foot in length. He's absolutely massive. I'll tell you what, he's making me very, very, very nervous. You're okay, mate, you're okay. Now, it's important with black members that you just gotta stay very, very calm with these animals. Settle down, ah, settle down, settle down. When he strikes, he'll take his time, but when he hits a spot, he'll hit it with 100% accuracy. The black member, he never misses. Now, I'm just trying to calm down with him, just a little bit, calm down, mate. Hey, settle down, mate, you're okay. Now, I've gotta be very, very careful because as I'm here, I can feel the sun on the back of my neck, and I know if I'm getting warm, he's getting warm as well. And that means energy. That means he can turn around and just whoop, get a nice big bite on me. And out here, these poor villagers, they get bitten by a snake like this, and it's all over for them. It's all over. It's okay. I'm feeling pretty good about catching that snake and I've moved him away from the village because back here, lunch is ready. 
So shima, shima is uh, when you get the maize and you mix it with water. Yes. Now shima is the the staple food out here in these villages, and it's very easy to uh, very easy to prepare. We have food. Do you want me to stir? Yes. Okay. <laughs> if I if I do it wrong, it's not my fault. <laughs> Are they ready to eat? That tastes all right, not too bad. That tastes good, tastes good. Very good. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we've got some some caterpillars mm. and we've got this, this, these are vegetables. Vegetables, chapati, chapati, <laughs> yeah. and uh, dried fish that we just uh, got down from the river. Yeah. So you got absolutely everything out here. Yes. Everything from the vegetables, yeah. which tastes very, very sweet. Yeah, vegetables that is rip. Rip. Yeah. You got your caterpillars. Which tastes nice. very similar to chips. Yeah. I'm gonna have to get used to all this. Like, you got the fish. Which tastes like fish. And then your chapati. Which tastes a bit like potato. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Thank you. There you go. That's eating for you. Out here in the tribal part of Zambia, right in the western province. Uh -huh, we're Woo! Thank you. All right. I'm checking under the rocks to see if I can find one of the most deadly creatures around, the scorpion. You really don't want to meet one of these little guys, but I'm going to see if I can rustle one up to show you. Here we go, here we go. All right, now this guy, he's pretty deadly. This guy's dangerous. It's always good to just put a little bit of sand over your hand because being bit by a scorpion like this wouldn't be a good thing. All right, now this little guy here, he's deadly, he's dangerous. This is an outback scorpion that we have out here, right in the arid region. You can just see the size of him, he's absolutely massive. Now taking a hit from a little guy like this out here, Tell you what, you've been in a lot of pain. It's supposed to feel like boiling water under the skin. Absolutely intense pain. You can just see, look at the size of those pincers on him. He's absolutely massive. Hey, look at you. Yeah, he's holding onto the stick. Yeah, you wish it was my face you were grabbing onto, wasn't it? Oh yeah, look at that. You can just see that stinger right at the back, how big that stinger is. Go right into you like a needle. I'll tell you what, you're a very intriguing little character, aren't you? Sure are. Right, mate, let me get you out of here. Out of harm's way. So that scorpion was dangerous, but I'm on the lookout for something even more deadly. I'm meeting up with one of the local rangers who's promised to show me where I can find one of Africa's most iconic snakes, the forest cobra. It is so hot out here. Oh, welcome. Now this guy here, he's a forest cobra. Yes, a forest see? cobra. Forest cobra. Yes. You can just see. How long he comes up. He fans out, come over here. Yes. Come here, come around this way. Yes. Come around this way. Okay. And see how he does this? Yes. See, so he just comes up. Yes. This guy is responsible yes. for killing a lot of people in Africa. Right. <laughs> right. Come over here. Right, come over this side, over this side. Yeah. Settle down. Settle down. Is it the one in your area? Settle down. This guy here in your country? He's absolutely massive. Yes. Big, big snake. Very big. Ah, ah, ah. Settle. Settle down. He's okay. He's okay. This snake has a neurotoxin, and what this neurotoxin does is it acts as a paralyzer. And you can see 
He's absolutely gorgeous. Can you just settle? Settle. It's now fond of you. With snakes, you've got to move very, very slow. See how he copies? I move my hand like so. Here in Africa, we've got three different species of zebra. This guy here, he's known as a plains zebra, and he'll move throughout this savanna, moving in a small social group, chewing on all this dry grass. He'll just get it right at the back of his molars, chew, 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 grind, grind, grind. But they're absolutely beautiful. They just keep a real close eye on me. Hey, how you going, mate? He's absolutely gorgeous, isn't he? Look at him. They're not worried about me, you know, I'm only about 50 metres distance and they just keep into themselves. It's important to note that no two zebras are alike. No, they're all different. They've all got different stripes up and down, up and down. So it's, um, it's pretty hard to pick them out though. You know, you wouldn't be able to pick out George, Fred, Amber and Anne. No, definitely not. They all look exactly the same. All right, mate. You can see he's got his ears up, smelling me. I'll tell you what, they're absolutely beautiful animals, aren't they? Lucky for me, zebras weren't the only animals on the plains. Luckily also, I remembered to bring my running shoes. Let's see how fast a cheetah really is. As soon as I was approaching that cheetah, him and his little cub, he sort of just stood there, looked at me, sort of just giving me a wide berth, gave a bit of a growl. It's insane. You come any closer, I'm gonna take a good run at you. Absolutely beautiful. And he's been watching the gazelles on the other side. I thought I'd just come up nice and close, showing my presence. So that way it's more comfortable for me to walk through. But there you go, the cheetah. My last day, and how good is this? I ended where I started, with the king of the jungle, the African lion. Now, I definitely do not recommend anyone do this if you go on safari. They might look like big pussycats, but they are killers. As ever, I know how to judge an animal situation. There he is. Over the other side, he is just watching me. It's always funny with lions. When you've just spotted one, what you haven't realised is the other four which are behind you. Slowly stalking you. This is a hunting game. It then becomes a game of survival. So, how did my tally go? I've worked out I've seen 23 amazing African animals in just seven days. kind of reflect back on moments like these. It's almost like you're taking pictures in your brain in those moments. And there are times that bring you to a point of, 
of a sense of happiness and a sense of a sense of freedom. The experience was absolutely breathtaking. Something that I'll hold with me forever. My name is Andrew Eucles. Yeah, I'm out of here. Adventurer, survivalist, and wildlife warrior. That's probably the toughest day of my entire life. I pushed myself to the limit. Whoa. That was just a love bite, as you can see. In the harshest and most dangerous environments on Earth. They are absolutely terrifying. It's just me and my camera. Look at you, you're absolutely gorgeous. As I outrun and outthink some of the fastest and smartest creatures on the planet. Ah! I didn't know they did that. Last year, I walked across Arnhem Land. I recorded it on both a phone and a handy cam. So what you're about to see right now is some very rough and raw footage. We're in a little bit of a hell hole. Not so much a TV show, but a series of diary cams strung together. Yeah, it's tough, but you've got to keep going. You're about to see me literally waste the way before your eyes on an epic survival quest. My hand is now broken. It's a treacherous journey of almost 600 kilometres. This is the hardest bloody thing I've ever had to do. Battling alone through some of the toughest terrain on Earth. This is what it's come to, being barefoot. But my <laughs> feet are gone. Hunting for food. OK, catch the brown money. I've just seen some buffalo and desperately searching for water. But it has to be water. <laughs> Was I insane? Whoa, 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 whoa! Maybe. I started on the east coast of Arnhem Land, at the top of Australia, and I planned to walk west all the way to Catherine. A journey of almost 600 kilometres. And I wanted to try and make it in about 40 days. This is what it takes to cross Arnhem Land. I'm going to welcome you to Australia's last frontier. Enter the gates of hell. So in order to achieve this mission, I had to use a horse. I'd found myself a three-year-old quarter horse that I'd named Arnhem. Come on, Good boy. Arnhem's role was to carry all the important supplies, all the gear that was necessary for me to go from point A to point B of this journey. Arnhem was a wild free horse and had never been fitted with a pack saddle before. So I know absolutely nothing about horses, and more so the horse knew absolutely nothing about me. Good boy. This was going to be our first interaction and first time doing anything like this before. You're in training, my little baby. Come on. All right, Trudy, so today's the first day uh, that we're going to be um, walking um, off to base camp one, and uh, I've got the horse. Adam, he's all saddled up, ready to go. Uh, as you can see, he's probably not too excited about this. Still in training, but um, we've got to get going. We've got uh, 11 kilometres to do today. So hopefully he'll be a bit more comfortable with those pack saddles. What do you reckon, mate? Yeah, he's not too impressed. <laughs> Arnhem Land represented an absolute fear of mine. A fear in the fact that you could get lost, you could vanish. A landscape which was unforgiving. A landscape which had its own conditions and own plans of your survival. If something went wrong out there, 
I was all alone. Getting lost out here simply would mean that I would die. I thought I'd start by showing you how incredibly difficult this terrain is. It is just almost impassable. It's just so thick, and that's been the first five kilometres. And five kilometres has taken me about three hours. It's very tricky trying to go through this type of terrain. Literally macheting my way through using my this is my body. Isn't that right, mate? He's just like getting into the water. That sun's coming up high too. It was unbelievable to see the amount of feral animals out there on the landscape. From brumbies to donkeys, scrub bulls, buffaloes, and even boars. A boar. Hey, get out of here, you And they're fearless, but they'll come up to the horses. Bulls can be extremely dangerous animals, and one of these bulls charging at you, equipped with these razor-sharp tusks, can cause some serious, serious damage. He's spooked. It's OK. Settle. Settle. We're going to manage this. Hey. And Arnhem was absolutely terrified, and I had to absolutely protect him. All right. Come on, Arnhem. Good boy. Good boy. I recall on the first day, I was actually considering quitting. I've only walked seven kilometres. Took me five hours. The horse had been busted up a bit. Pack saddle was broken on the side. I'm only halfway to base camp one. Now I've got 50 base camps. And this terrain is so thick, it's just not funny. Uh, if you're on the open straight, it's easy, but through this, it's just it's almost impossible. Hey, not good, eh? That's a scrub ball. I've just been trying to just let the horse know that when he's with me, there's no problem, there's no fear. We keep moving, doesn't matter what animal it is, we push past it. There's more buffalo. That's your reaction. Come on, we'll keep our distance. Keep our distance. Steady. Steady. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. I see buffaloes. Um, my main job is to move them on. Horse are terrified. I come towards them like this. They can be dangerous, but for the most part, they just want nothing to do with people. So I normally just put the run on. So. Spook them on. There's a big bull right there. And I just want to let that horse know whenever we see buffalo, church. Relax, everything's all, everything's okay. I'm gonna spook him off. Just like that. All right. That was probably the toughest day of my entire life. We've arrived at base camp one. Right here, a nice, beautiful billabong. Probably got salties in there. We're gonna be very careful. Hopefully some barramundi. Crocodiles are a big problem in this area, and I don't want us to become dinner. How are we going, Anna? So, because I don't want to get him too close to the water's edge. I just have to do. As a baseline, I'd bought some rations, essentially as extra energy to get me through the day. But this energy wasn't going to be enough. I obviously had to hunt down my own food, barehanded, on foot, this was the only way it was going to be possible to survive out there. So look, when you start getting good at this, um, you start identifying what they call like a microhabitat. So an area in which uh, fish will retreat or feed. So for barramundi, generally it's under snags, under roots. 
Um, there's one just over there. In Northern Australia, there's plenty of fish, and in particular, the barramundi, a topwater feeder, but an absolute aquatic predator as well. And the barramundi are absolutely amazing to eat. It's all about being very stealthy, being very slow moving, being patient, and keeping your eyes sharp. So all I've done is I've just been cutting up this barramundi, essentially just taking these nice long steaks off it. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put some salt. You always lose in so many salts when you're out sweating. It's unbelievable. You've got to replenish it somehow. And I think the best way to do that is, well, on your meal. All right, I'm gonna put that on the hot coals. At the end of that first day, the fear, the initial fear that I had was the sense of being alone. That was the fear. It was terrifying to think that I was out there in that situation now just with me and that horse. Got my trusty steed there. And the only thing I had to rely on was my skill and my ability. That was terrifying. I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever seen the sky like this before. It's absolutely unbelievable. The stars are just, they're just, they're literally like diamonds up there. It's so bright. These guys, they can pack a punch, they can kill people. So I'm just gonna be real careful, steady. What happens is when you're out here in Arnhem Land, you learn to share your bathing places with some of the exotic animals, I guess you could call them. Oh, come on, mate. I just want to have a wash. Seriously? Hey! <laughs> I have a friend of mine who is an animal behaviorist. And his opinion on why these wild animals won't attack me is based on the fact that they actually think I'm crazy. Wow, 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 wow. And guess what? It actually seems to work. Put my legs in the air. Wow, 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 wow. Wow, wow, wow. Some days it'd literally take hours to hunt down my food. But other days, I got a lot of food quickly. Right, so there's a sooty grunter and a barramundi under this log here. Now, the barramundi's probably twice the size of a sooty grunter. But um, I had barramundi yesterday, so I'm gonna try for the black brim. There are several species of fish that you find out here in these rivers. And um, this guy here, he's known as the sooty grunter, or the black brim. And it is the best tasting fish literally out here in Arnhem Land. 
and that there is probably just the average size that I've been getting. Uh, not quite as big as the Barramundis, obviously, but mate, Chuchi, they taste 10 times better. So, we'll get this guy ready. So, whenever we've been walking throughout the heat of the day, first thing I like to do is give this guy a bit of a swim. <laughs> <laughs> but some of these places are absolutely amazing. And this is the uh, Wilton River that I'm on right now. And you can just see how crystal clear the water is. And it just goes and goes and goes and goes. And this is exactly where I've been getting all my fish. Like a big dog, big pussycat. Hey. My plan of attack for each day was to walk anywhere between 10 to 15 kilometres. And at the end of each day, I had to get to water. And I had to get there before dark. The purpose of getting there before dark was to allow me to set up base camp. So when I come to a base camp, what I want to do, ah, here, I'll be quick, I'll show you, is I want to be somewhere where I'm close to water. Critically important, you need to bathe, you need to wash, you need to catch food, and you need to drink. Um, this is my tent, it's just a simple one man tent. Um, I've got everything that I need just here, I've got my pack saddle bags, all my equipment, uh, my hand spear, and I have my fire almost ready to go. I've got my water, uh, just to boil some water for him, a knife. Um, today's meal, which is a sooty grunter. And then always in plain sight, where I'm sleeping, I have the horse. And every single time before I go to bed, I've got him on the heart line, as you can see. So he can't escape. Before I go to bed, I put the hobbles on him. So if he does take off, he's not going to go far and he will be next to water. I'll just show you now, like so, sun's just setting. And that is how we set up base camp here in Arnhem Land. I think in all seriousness, there's only so much fish that you can actually eat. And it was time for me to go for some red meat, some buffalo. Water buffalo are identified as an invasive species. And up here, you're allowed to hunt and kill them. Just gonna turn the GoPro on. I'm going to see if I can catch that buffalo. The trick to catching uh, water buffalo in the Northern Territory is stick to one, stick to a cow. Sometimes a lone cow is good to go for. Keep on her, keep on her, keep on her. Get her to turn back and then um, try and get a lasso. Once you got that lasso, I just use the trees. Settle. Hey. Hey. Just like a jigsaw, you know, tree to tree, tree to tree, tree to tree. And uh, that's, that's how you do it. The heat out here can spoil the meat quite fast. So I'm using an old school bushes technique, meat safe. So I've just got a mosquito net, I've just put some rocks around it. And that way, uh, not only does it keep it off the ground to keep it away from the ants, but most importantly, it keeps it away from the flies as well. So, um, yeah, just a simple little trick with a mosquito net. Hang your meat throughout the night, keep it nice and cool. Right. So I'm just putting some buffalo steaks 
on the grill. The smell of the meat cooking is unbelievable. I can't describe the relief that you feel when you finally have some red meat in front of you. It's pretty ready. Not only is it delicious, it's absolutely satisfying to have something a little bit different. How good's that? Well, you can't beat. These buffalo steaks are great. Mmm. A bit chewy. But... That taste is just amazing. It's a beautiful morning out here in Arnhem Land. You can just see how amazing and fresh it is. And, uh, just cooking some staple rice there. Got some buffalo meat, some camp set up. And there's a uh, good old Arnhem doing what he has to do. So, yeah, just trying to be as uh, productive and minimalistic as possible with uh, what I'm doing. Hmm. I think we've got an issue. You right? What's the problem? What do you see? You stay here. Stay, stay, stay. It's funny. Big water buffalo. seen some buffalo. I'm going to try and catch a small one. So that sounded like a good idea at the time, but about two minutes later, I was in a whole world of pain. Oh, <laughs> oh, I freaking broke my ankle. I need to break my ankle. Twist my ankle. Twist my ankle. One of the greatest fears in this was knowing that if something went wrong, I was going to be alone. I knew the amount of trouble that I was going to be in. I still remember what it sounded like when I twist my ankle. It almost sounded like a sense of, a sense of failure. Right, so it's early morning. But uh, when I was chasing that buffalo down, I actually rolled my ankle. Oh, very tender. I'm just trying to move it around a bit. I've got bandage to strap it, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to wear um, just a bit of a rise up on the ankle just to give it a bit of support with the palladiums. And um, just with the other shoe I'll wear, just my morel. The reason being, you're probably thinking, well, why wouldn't you just wear two pairs of boots? Well, I only got one because I lost the other one through the bush. And I was done um, with a horse. I must have came off the pack saddle. So I do a bandage there to bandage. Oh! Oh, that's extremely painful walking. You gotta keep moving, eh? You have to keep moving. You can't stop. The first thing I realised in Arnhem Land was the fact that I was insignificant. The landscape around me was so large and so wide. It was somewhat overpowering as well. And this will give you some sense of an idea of just how remote and how vast this landscape is. Go 
I think what's interesting is in that situation where you start to become somewhat fragile, somewhat sensitive to everything coming around you, is things start to deteriorate fast. All right, so we're still moving. Up we go. Just. All right, so let me tell you a bit, a bit, of, a bit of a story. So I decided to go with two pairs of shoes when I was out here. Uh, one being Palladium, the other one being Merrill. Now, on the first week, I actually lost one of my Palladium boots. Um, so I only had the left um, Palladium boot, and that's my pair of Merrills. Well, I'm halfway through the trip, and this is what they look like, ready? As you can see, uh, they're absolutely being torn to shreds. Uh, but I'm still gonna keep moving, uh, even though I'm down to, um, well, I guess free, free pretty much destroyed shoes. At 20 days in, I could see the condition of my body changing. And at this point, I'd estimated I'd lost roughly about 10 kilos. All right, Chuch. Well, I thought what I'd do is I'd show you um, at least one of my staples anyway. And these are high energy biscuits. That's exactly what they are. And they're just in this foil packet, obviously waterproofed. Um, this will keep for, for God knows how long. Essentially, they identified as a as an emergency ration, but when you're out here, you need your carbs. You know, it's all good to be getting your protein and all that sort of stuff, but you, you can't live just off protein. So that's what they look like. They're kind of like a shortbread. They actually don't taste too bad. So for two, you're looking at about 3,800 uh, kilojoules of energy, which is amazing, absolutely fantastic, and so compact. So um, I've been having one of these a day, plus the rice, um, and that seems to be keeping me um, Pretty, you know, pretty all right, pretty all right. You know, I'm obviously starving, but um, it'll do the job at the end of the day. At night, I go hunting for tasty little treats that you can find in the billabongs and streams. And that there are what they call cherubin. Now, they're an awesome feed out here. And so, let me just turn the side off. And so, this is exactly what I've been living on at night time. I've just been going around with my torch, my water torch. And they are an absolute amazing, amazing feed. And actually quite easy to catch. So this is gonna be the hardest part of the stretch, the longest distance that we go without water. And as you can see, um, Arnhem's exhausted. You know, he's trailing behind. It's like I'm literally pulling him. Now the frustration is, we've got about 14 kilometers to water. And if he collapses in the middle, I can't, well, what am I going to do? You know, at the best I can go, I can fill up the bladders, come back, give him water, try and keep moving. Well, there was a day that I think I'll never forget, and that was a day when I rocked up and there was no water. But it has to be water. I hope there's water. Please be water. Please be water. I guess one of the greatest fears that I've always had is the fear of unpredictability. And getting there to the water source and seeing that there's no water, the first feeling that you get is a, is a sense of fear. You, know, you, become, you become scared. Scared... Scared in not knowing what lies ahead. Scared in not knowing if you can find water in a time which is needed. That's, that's terrifying, absolutely terrifying. So we're just... Managed to get some bit of shade here. Still got just under a litre of water. Also resting on resting out of the sun. The way I'd plotted my route through Arnhem Land was essentially identifying water sources. 
Uh, I'm just going over my coordinates at the moment, essentially trying to find the closest spot where we can get water from. Um, my next spot is around eight kilometres from here, just under, and we'll, we'll uh, see if there's water. But the notion we're going without water is terrifying. And what it essentially does is it strikes a chord in you instinctively that wants you to go searching for water, it wants you to find water. And this is where it can get dangerous. Walking throughout the daytime looking for water in those kind of conditions, you'd be lucky to last two days. And this is when it starts getting tough, you know. We've come into spots trying to get water. There's no water and I'm carrying water for him now. It's been hot out here. A bit hot. But um, we've still got a bit of a way to go. And uh, but he can't wait to get home, same as me. Isn't that right? Hey, Arnhem. If you want to survive Arnhem Land, you need to watch what the animals are doing around you. I became very good at actually tracking the water buffaloes down and seeing the generational movements that they had put down in front of me. Now, essentially, this was a map of how to get to water. Okay. Finally, we got to water. Finally, we got to water. <laughs> He's just been splashing around. Here I can. Here we go, Adam. Hey, Adam. Well, you can imagine there's obviously going to be a lot of relief when you finally come across water. You know, not just for me, but for the animal as well. And he's obviously taking as much pleasure as he can in the fact that, wow, you know, we've finally found water. We're finally here. We've just put some hard yards in, trying to get the water. Right, as soon as he's gotten here, he really just came into the water like a fish. And we're both just trying to just keep guzzling and guzzling and guzzling. But it's tough out here, you know? It doesn't matter if you're a water buffalo, if you're a pig, if you're a donkey, or if you're a horse or a human. It's so difficult out here in Arnhem Land. And when you find water, how good is it, eh? when you're going through a place where, you know, it's literally like a desert out there. You'll see places where not even the crows will land. And then all of a sudden, there's this oasis of water that's sitting right in front of you. The feeling's absolutely amazing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I tell you, Spear, Barramundi, here in Arnhem Land, you just gotta keep them focused, watch them. Sometimes I'll be in a deep pool, sometimes I'll be in a shallow pool, but you just gotta keep on it, keep on them, keep on them, keep on it. Well, <laughs> I had to hit him couple of times, but I finally got him. So you catch Barramundi, Arnhem Land style. That mouth, it's a massive mouth. Coming across and actually finding water, I guess naturally the, the first thing that I want to do is I want to recuperate. This was time to relax. I think the second thing is obviously for the horse as well. You know, this is going to be a long haul for the horse. What was ahead was an environment that was going to be unlike what I'd crossed. It was going to be tough. The terrain was going to be unforgiving. And for this, I had to prepare. We 
this gives you a bit of an idea of the kind of country that I'm going through now. And this is what they call your escarpment plateau country out here in Arnhem Land. And you can just see how amazingly beautiful this landscape is. This here, it's a wild landscape. It's a very wild landscape. Come on, mate. Good boy. Good boy. So we're, we're in a little bit of a hell hole. Um, so we've walked into a gorge. It's taken a day to get in. And uh, I don't know if you can see that all the way around, it's just a gorge, a massive gorge. And I've tried to come out the other side. Um, nah, not even a goat could get up the other side, quite literally. That's how steep it is. So now, just trekking through. I'm um, just trying to find a way up. I hadn't seen an unforgiving landscape until this day. I'd walked into this canyon area and I was thinking to myself, how the hell am I going to get over this escarpment labyrinth? The biggest problem now was I wasn't on path. I was lost. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find, uh, I'm, honestly, I'm following the buffalo, donkey and wild horse tracks because they're essentially showing me the easiest way to get through this type of country. <coughs> Just give you a bit of an example of these exact paths They're like this. Kind of trail their way through the escarpment country. Uh, and that's all you can do is just hope that the tracks keep going. So there was now two problems that I faced. The problem of being lost on one hand and then on the other hand, the fact that my shoes had been absolutely obliviated by the landscape, this was going to be absolute hell. I had to do the rest of the journey barefoot. Well, we've been walking along this, uh, this ridge line, just trying to find a way up and over. And we haven't found one yet. And this is the type of stuff that I've been walking on, just like rock. It's absolutely killing my feet. Feet are gone. The most concerning thing now about walking barefoot was going to be this. From the rocks, to the spear grass, to the spinifex. It was literally like walking on devil's marbles out there. And you can imagine that walking on this type of terrain was obviously going to slow me down. And I've still got about 100 kilometres of, of walking to do. Hopefully it won't all be this rocky landscape. But uh, yeah, it's tough, but you've got to keep going. Doesn't matter, a bit of pain here and there, aches, cramps, whatever, doesn't matter. You just keep going, you keep walking, you keep walking, you keep walking. And he knows that too, eh? He knows it too. I believe in many ways the landscape can torment you. And the unfortunate thing is, when you spend so much time on a landscape like this, it takes a part of you away. And I felt that sense when I was out there. Looks like I'll be able to get up through there somehow. Uh, I'm just gonna go check it out. The sun's falling a bit. It'd be good to get up on top of the escarpment um, before sundown. Probably be walking through this stuff at night time. It's too treacherous, too dangerous, not just for me, but for the horse as well. You can just see this is what I, it's come to being barefoot on this. Hopefully we can get on top of this ridge. Give you sense of an idea of where we are. Yeah. It's called hell. Absolute hell. You see, the thing about nature is nature's not always on your side. Sometimes you're fighting against it. And in this situation here, where I'd almost lost hope, I was starting to question the very beliefs and values that I had out there and whether I could undertake this. Can this be done? Am I going the right way? Excuse you. Sense of an idea of some of the hills. I've got to walk. They're just pure rock. Right here. And some of them are so steep. It's all part of the journey though.
That's just a small barramundi. Well, that will be tonight's feed. I'm just going to whack it straight onto a little grill here. So, yeah, I'm starting to get sick of barramundi, to be honest. Uh, if I don't ever eat the fish again, uh, I wouldn't care. But um, that's food. The horse became more than just a necessity of the mission. He became a lifeline. I think he became a friend. To have something there, an animal, something I could relate to, something that could help push me along the way was going to be absolutely vital in me achieving this mission. So in this situation here, I'd obviously made a mistake. Sometimes you just can't read the landscape. And at this point in time, I was completely off map. I'd unfortunately read the landscape wrong. So it took me two days coming in from there to get to this point here. Because I thought there was a way up through the escarpment, and guess what, it's not. So now I've got to walk two days back and then come up another way. <laughs> it's not easy, eh? It's not easy. This is the hardest bloody thing I've ever had to do. There's Arnhem down there. Okay. All right, well, we've lost two days. It doesn't matter. Not much further to go, mate. Come on. So you can kind of imagine the situation right now. I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I'm exhausted. All of a sudden, this is a recipe for disaster. This is when mistakes happen. This morning, we had a bit of an issue. Um, coming down like a bit of an escarpment, rocky pass for the horse. Uh, long story short, never wrap a rope around your hand. Um, we had a bit of a fall, and it would seem that my hand is now broken. Uh, I heard it snap just across, across here. You can just see that it's pretty well swollen and inflamed and it's mightily hard to even close it like that, which is not good. Um, it seems to put a bit of a downer on things, but I'm um, going to keep moving, keep pushing along. Uh, and um, I've always got my left hand, right? Yeah, yeah. Really so at this point in time, there was a number of emotions I was feeling, and one of which was that of fear. To look at it in this way, it was actually fear that was driving me to complete this. I had to harness this energy, and I had to use it to the best of my advantage. It was going to be my energy in getting from point A to point B. We've got 50 kilometres, no, 55 kilometres to go. We can do it, buddy. I know it's hard. We can do it. It was about 10 years ago that I wanted to walk across Arnhem Land. I remember sitting in a pub and there was an old guy there. And I told him, I go, I want to walk across Arnhem Land. And he said, you're a fool, you're an idiot. He goes, you don't even know what Arnhem Land looks like. I flew over it with a helicopter. It's got hills and escarpments. Yeah, it's, it's impossible, it's treacherous, it can't be done. You're an idiot. 10 years later, I find myself at the top of one of the highest plateaus. Having got the horse through, we're at the top of the escarpment country, and from here on, it's flat.
So it was the last day, and essentially I'd started to feel almost like a shell of myself. Being mentally fatigued and exhausted, my physical abilities had obviously deteriorated. I think I lost close to 15 kilos. I went in at 70, came out at 56. It's unbelievable what you can put your body through. But there was still this fire that was inside both of us. It was this perseverance that what we had started, we were going to finish. And now we could see the finish line. The road, the finish line is just up ahead, 50 metres ahead. And I'm exhausted. I'm mentally and physically exhausted. So there you go, that's how you walk across Arnhem Land. And I got some great news. <laughs> the noble steed pulled through. He lost a bit of condition, but he pulled through. I've walked uh, 586 kilometres in 42 days, starting from Numbawa and finishing now on Catherine Gorge Road. And what a hell of an experience it's been. So my end point of the endeavour was a road. A road that led back to civilization, that led back to Catherine. It was here that I was going to be meeting up with a friend that would take me back, back to a world that I had almost forgotten. And here we are, on the road. We've made it. First time my feet have touched pavement in 42 days. What a walk it's been, you know. What a walk it's been. So having finally finished walking across Arnhem Land, I remember coming out into the road with the horse. There was now time to reflect on the entire experience and having seen the fact that I'd now walked across and essentially had conquered Arnhem Land. But there was still a part of Arnhem Land that exists inside me today. Arnhem Land was all about opening my eyes up. Not just to my world, but to the world around me. Now. But within this, it gives you appreciation for a landscape, an ancient landscape. A landscape that demands our respect. Arnhem Land is an experience that everyone should undertake in their lifetime. Something that really evokes the human spirit. So this is my good mate, Daniel Freed. This guy here, yeah. <laughs> he's driven all the way from Berkeley <laughs> to come and get me. Well, good mate, happy you're alive. <laughs> oh, God. All right, let's go get a feed and have a drink, eh? Yeah, mate. Quick, kiss the camera. Give it kisses. <laughs> all right. <laughs>